All right, welcome. Thank you for joining this presentation, OPM, OPX, the differences in the future. We have two chat options, one on the right-hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions for the speakers, we would like to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose, but we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. If you're asking a question to the speakers, please use a question mark at the beginning of the question. This makes it easy for us to scroll through and identify the questions. Now I'd like to hand it off to our moderator for this session, Russ Atkins, and we'll get started. Hey, Russ, thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are all gl glad, so glad that you selected this session this afternoon. I'm Russ Atkins, a longtime member of WCET, a higher education consultant and a member of quality a proud member of the Quality Matters Board, Board of Directors. It's my pleasure to introduce our, Dr. Dr. Darcy. <laughs> Let's try that again. Dr. Dr. Darcy Hardy and Jessica Sheehan from Blackboard. Darcy serves as the Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs North America at Blackboard Inc. Her work focuses on the online learning ecosystem and how it impacts all parts of the institution and organization. Prior to her position with Blackboard, Dr. Hardy spent over 25 years in public higher ed. Darcy shares, however, that the most important thing in her life is her family. She tells me that she's so proud of both of her daughters and best of all being a gamma to her uh, grandson, Owen, and a soon-to-be granddaughter who is making her debut in February. Darcy is also, in the meantime, taking up pickleball. Darcy's joined by Jessica Sheehan, Senior Director of Marketing Services for Blackboard Inc. Jessica has played an instrumental role in the development and management of Blackboard's OPX solution for institutions looking to develop and grow online programs, degrees, and portfolios. Jessica has been working for Blackboard and in the higher education space for the last 11 years. When Jessica isn't thinking about the best position for online degrees for growth and scale, she's outside with her family, including her husband, her five-year-old daughter, nine-year-old son, uh, engaged in mountain biking and skiing, depending on the season. It is such a pleasure to turn this over to Darcy and Jessica, who have a great presentation for us. Great, thank you, Russ. It's always so nice to have you involved um, whenever we're speaking. Um, and, and when you fumbled a little bit on my name, it's funny because when I got married, uh, my maiden name was Walsh. And my mother pulled me aside after the wedding at the reception and said, you've got to keep Walsh because Darcy Hardy is too hard to say over and over again. And it almost sounds like Mickey Mouse. So I, uh, I usually include the Walsh in there <laughs> and it makes it easier for people to, to say my name. Um, but really delighted to be here. I um, want to make one correction for Jess and I that um, we are now with Anthology. Uh, as of last week, Blackboard merged and we closed on Monday. Um, still the same people, two companies coming together uh, in a merger, and we're going to have just a great portfolio for people. Um, this session um, is one that we're that we've talked about a lot and we speak about it quite a bit at Blackboard just in conversation. And to be clear, Jessica and I, Jess and I are not salespeople. Um, we support sales, we help sales, but we both work with the more strategic side of online learning and OPX and the delivery of those kinds of services. So just wanted to set that stage a little bit. Um, uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, Catherine. Okay, so let's start here. When we start thinking about whether it's OPM, OBX, online learning, um, we're all sort of looking toward the future. It's, a, it's kind of a scary thought right now because when we're still in the middle of COVID and maybe going into the next phase of COVID or whatever, it's not post yet, but whatever it is, we all need to be thinking about where we're going to be in the future and trying to see what's in the future is extremely difficult right now um, because of the pandemic. Um, so what we wanna do is kind of talk about some of the things that we're seeing, 
um, and what we're seeing in the future. And hopefully that will help you as you make decisions going forward. Um, she's a cute little girl. Um, can we go to the next slide? So let's start here. Um, if you've been following statistics in the news and in higher ed and and others uh, and other sources like IHE or the Chronicle, you know that there has been a lot of discussion about enrollment challenges that may be on the horizon. Um, the U.S. population is projected to decline, meaning fewer traditional high school graduates. Socioeconomic groups who will make up a growing share of the population tend to have lower college going rates. And there are some economists that estimate there could be a loss of 15% of the typical college going population. And, and put that together with the fact that during COVID, we had a lot of students who either stopped for a while, stopped completely, um, lost their jobs, didn't have money to go to school. Um, all of those things sort of play into this. And, you know, on top of that, you have students who are working and who are resigning. The great resignation is upon us. Um, and because they're resigning from their positions, they may be stopping school or they might be going back. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But the main thing here is if you're at an institution right now and you're thinking about the future and you're trying to look into the future, you have to accept that the numbers are going down. They're in decline and that's global. That's not just in the United States. So when you're having conversations at your institution about enrollments, you have to remember it's no longer a build it and they will come. Um, there are so many reasons why you may not have the numbers that you had previously. So we can go to the next slide. So on the other hand, the good news, sort of, if you think about reasons why you might see some increases in enrollments and it's not all doomsday and gloom, um, during COVID, as you know, the unemployment rate peaked at 14.8 in April of 2020. That was the highest rate observed since data collection began in 1948. Now, have we been coming back? Absolutely. Um, people are getting back to work, hence the resignations. Also, um, people are changing their minds about what they want to do. They are getting back to work and they are now thinking about their education again. So many, many adults are rethinking, uh, and by adults, I mean you know anyone over traditional age. They're rethinking who they want to be and where they want to be as far as their careers, which means they may be coming back to you to enroll in your programs. Um, there's also the some college no credential population. This is you know, well known across the country. We've got about 36 million Americans who left post-secondary um, without earning a credential. It could be um, a certificate, it could be a degree. This is universities and colleges um, that they're out there. So there's a population out there. And if you go to the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, CAIL, you can see what that number is in your own state. So there are people out there. And then the last thing to be thinking about is, and I, I really do believe that this will be the case, as we come out of COVID, more and more adults are going to be thinking about the fastest way to get the knowledge and the skills they need to complete. Um, they're not necessarily looking for an easy way out, but they don't have time to be sitting in a classroom and taking a full bachelor's degree of things that are wonderful for a well-rounded education, but not something they necessarily want right now. So I think you're gonna see a resurgence of CBE or CBE Lite or personalized learning, whatever you wanna call it, that is giving these adults a way to come back. So while you're thinking about, well, the enrollments are dropping, everybody's seeing enrollment declines. And based on the traditional pipeline, it's going to continue to decline, unfortunately. So we have to start thinking, okay, are, the, are there students out there that we could go after? These are the kinds of students that you should be thinking about in the adult population that can make you, um, can bring some of those enrollments back. You have to think about how to do it. 
Um, let's go to the next slide. I wanted to include this slide. Some of you have probably seen this before because I, 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 we, I use it, we use it a lot. This is our quality learning matrix that we developed at Blackboard several years ago. And the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because when you're thinking about whether it's OPM or OPX, which we're gonna talk more about, or online in general, you have to be thinking of all these pieces. Um, that it's not just about you know, having one piece, whether you're marketing or whether you're worrying about your course design or you think that you're picking the right programs. There are all these other things that wrap around it to make it quality and to make you successful. And if you're going to be competitive going forward, you have to consider these things. You can't just think, well, we're going to keep doing things the way we are and we'll be competitive. Even if you've got these adult learners coming back, even as enrollments are declining, you should be thinking about what is our vision for where we want to be in five years and then the strategy of how you're going to get there. And that's where all these other pieces come in. So when you're thinking about the traditional sort of OPM model and looking at it the way we think about it, which, which Jess will talk about, it starts over in the first column and goes all the way through. Big chunks are in there, but for a school to be really competitive going forward, they've got to know where they're going and then use some of these elements to help them get there. Um, so I encourage you, this particular quality matrix is, is free and it's available um, if you just do a search for it because it's a great conversation piece to have the, the discussion about where are you going and what are the pieces you need to get there, which leads to sort of the OPX model. So let's go to the next slide. The demand for online is growing. And, and you know, we all saw the surveys that came from students um, during COVID. They were like, I hate this, it's, it's terrible. The faculty are never around. Um, no fault of the faculty and no fault of the institutions. We were like, you know, exploding heads trying to get our online programs online, our programs online. And students were not very happy with much of that. Um, but at the same time, the latest surveys tell us that students still want online. They just want it to be good. So the demand for online is going to grow globally um, and it's expected to continue to grow. Uh, now, we can't predict the future, but it's the, I guess we would say the horse is out of the barn in Texas. Um, it's not going backward. You know, there's gonna be more and more. So if you look at these enrollment trends, up to 2019, that's one way to look at it. But then if you add 2020 and 2021 in the middle of it and the, the full on exposure to all these students for online who are now saying, hey, I wanna keep going. So the increase is more and more and 85% of students considered non-traditional. I don't even like to say non-traditional anymore. I just say the, the traditional student is the student who is 25 and older. Um, and that's really where your giant market is because of those declining enrollments in the pipeline for various population reasons. So let's go to the next slide. Now, I mentioned the competition. Competition was pretty, pretty big, even pre-COVID for schools. Um, those who were doing online programming pre-COVID um, will understand, you know, that you always are looking at um, who your competitors are, um, how you pick the, the right programs, which ones are viable for your institution, which ones are going to draw the most students. Um, so that is one part of it. But also, people are spending money on media. They're spending money on marketing. Um, in order to get the programs out there. Now, a minute ago, I showed you the quality learning matrix. This isn't only about marketing, but if you don't have strong marketing and if you aren't doing program viability studies and research, it's hard to know which ones you should be spending your money on. And the way to be competitive is to get your name out there, to use media, to use marketing so that people know you exist um, and will see you, and especially you know, if you're at a small school and you may be doing fantastic work, but you know how far your reach is as far as people recognizing who you are. Um, in order to be competitive, 
media and marketing are some of the things that are going to help you get your name out there so that people know your brand. So what's been happening is the media spins have been growing. It was up 6% in 2019. The top 15 advertisers that are exclusively or primarily online, they spend 25 million per year on media advertising. So think about what higher education is trying to do. We don't have that kind of money, but we do have funding that we can use to make sure that people understand us. So marketing and media are a big part of this whole OPM, OPX model. I just wanted to make sure that we all understand that that's one part of it that's really important. So we'll go to the next slide. This is, it's, it's so hard for me to do a Zoom presentation because I always want to go, does anybody have any questions and raise your hands and, and, and challenge or ask what I'm talking about? So if you do have something like that, drop it in the chat and we'll get to it. Um, by no means are we knocking the OPM in this presentation at all. Um, but um, I'm one of those people that was around when OPMs first came onto the scene and, and have been involved with a few. Um, really made sense you know, about 10 years ago, um, pre-COVID. And one of the main reasons it was so interesting to a lot of schools was the revenue, revenue share model that is part of most OPMs. So they would front some funding to help get the courses up and get faculty developed and, and, and make sure that um, they were going after the right programs. Um, and they also were willing to have a cost model. We'll talk about that. The OPM was able to stand up programs. They, would, they could help you create the content. They could invest in the content development. Um, they helped you with marketing and media. They helped manage enrollments, bring enrollments to you. They had student support um, technology. And that was very, very um, uh, interesting. And people wanted something like that because online was still not mainstream enough to where institutions were actually having line budget lines created for some of these um, important um, activities. So the revenue share model was great. They could help you with investing, you know, in the marketing. And some of these OPMs, you know, they were doing a fantastic job of putting boots on the ground. You know, if it was a nursing program, they had people in the hospitals advertising for the program. So this was a great deal for institutions at the time. Um, OPMs were able to invest in the concept of online learning, um, requiring significant marketing and enrollment efforts. They were able to do that. But, you know, what also happened during that time was this revenue, revenue share model where while they are putting money up front and then they are getting a piece of, they're getting a piece of the uh, action when you enroll the students that they bring to you and you keep a percentage as well. For some, it worked out well, some not so much, but removing that cost consideration allowed um, institutions to go ahead and take a step forward um, to figure out, should we be doing this or should we not? So that was great. And again, people still find OPMs very helpful and so forth, but we're kind of moving into a new era and it's based not only on um, the model itself, but also the feedback from people that have been in these relationships, sometimes for many years and are unable to get out of them. So we can go to the next slide. This is one of the things to consider. You know, um, I do a lot of policy work and keep up with what's happening on the Hill and um, through the Center uh, for Advancing Learning, which I also direct at Blackboard uh, Anthology. Um, there are things that are being scrutinized and they're being scrutinized not only uh, on the Hill by many Congress people, but also in the Department of Education. And the, the reason why it's now being scrutinized is because everyone is involved and wants to know more about online. So for people who really weren't paying much attention um, at the federal level about OPMs and so forth, their attention is right there. And they have concerns about the rev share model and they have concerns about um, how people get out of contracts and you know, all of these things. So it's under increasing scrutiny. And there are plenty of research articles and, and just articles in general that you can Google and read for yourself. Um, and you can see where there are issues and where there aren't when you're trying to make a decision 
on what you want to do. But the bottom line, if we can go to the next slide, comes down to this. This is this is something that we hear um, quite often. Uh, I'm not giving you 50% of revenue if you if I don't need all of your services. I need to be able to select the services. And this is what leads us into the whole OPX concept of being able to provide the services. And when I showed you that quality learning matrix in full transparency at, at Anthology, we do all of those things. This is not a sales pitch, but we have basically taken those things and broken them into an a la carte. Um, and so now I'm going to turn it over to Jess and she's going to dig a little deeper into the things that you should know when you're considering whether it's an OPM or an OPX and where you're going to go in the future. So Jess, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Darcy. Um, so yeah, I think that as institutions are kind of looking to potentially shift away from OPM models, we can start to look at a model that we're calling, as Darcy mentioned, OPX. So this is really just online program experience. I um, mean, the, the, the X is sort of what you build that's right for your institution and your, your students. And that's, that's sort of a way that we look at it. Um, but when you think about it, it's sort of just breaking apart all of the things that, um, you know, typically come with an OPM. So you, as you look at it, you need to consider sort of all of these areas to really effectively deliver online degrees and programs. So some of these things may be built internally while, while others might be outsourced. It really sort of starts with that research-driven approach, understanding which programs you'll need to invest in, who your target audience is. You'll also um, you know, want to make sure you're considering the course and curriculum development, as well as the capabilities of your faculty in the online space thinking about technology foundations for delivery, looking at which solutions might be necessary for your mix of synchronous and asynchronous components, or as you think about that, what that mix might be. Um, also, you know, as we learn, as we know, and as, as Darcy mentioned, launching online programs really require some investment around marketing to drive interest, to compete with uh, the programs that are out there already, to drive awareness for new programs, um, and really drive leads and interest in your program. Um, and that investment is going to hopefully create volume. So then as you think about additional management through that enrollment funnel um, that you might need from application all the way through to enrollment. And then once you have all those new online students, another key consideration is the support and services that are needed for retention. Because um, one of the things, and we'll talk about this a little bit too, is that we know that online students, um, which typically do draw that adult learner, um, really need a unique set of services um, for retention and for the, the support that they need to um, achieve their outcomes. So if we go to the next slide. So, you know, I think we talked a little bit about revenue share OPM um, models versus OPX, and this is sort of a good way to kind of look at uh, kind of the difference between those two. So going with a revenue share OPM type partner really provides, as Darcy mentioned, that upfront low startup costs minimal need for in-house expertise and resources. Um, but the online market is evolving um, and a lot of institutions are seeing, we work with some of these institutions as well as they either transition out or sort of looking for alternatives. A lot of institutions are looking for more flexibility and control over their own programs. Um, and that's something that can be hard to achieve with a long-term contract that can come with an OPM. We've also seen that it can be challenging for schools um, because there's a lack of transparency around data and analytics. And one of the reasons this can be somewhat challenging is you're sort of missing this view into your own marketing performance that can actually do a lot to provide insight into how your programs are being received in the market and then also how you're competing in the market. All of that data from the point of lead generation all the way through to enrollment can be really, really helpful just in thinking about how you plan for and build your online um, portfolio. Um, and it doesn't always come easy when you've got a revenue share agreement. Um, so having more access to that data can be really, really helpful. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So it can be overwhelming to sort of consider each of these areas a la carte, uh, but these are the areas where we typically recommend to start when thinking about growing your own online portfolio. Um, and, and Darcy alluded to some of these. So, you know, first really understanding which programs are growing, where there's on competition. Um, it's not impossible to compete with the big online providers as long as you are able to articulate what sets you apart. Is it um, high touch support services, a unique curriculum, maybe your specific mix of synchronous versus asynchronous? 
Uh, you may even have a passionate alumni base who's looking for professional development. So it might be something that sets you apart specifically within your region. So thinking about that and how you're specifically um, going out and reaching that audience. Uh, being specific about your target population, recognizing that you're not gonna be able to serve everyone, understanding that this population is different than your traditional residential programs, um, and really knowing um, how this might change your competitive landscape too. You may not necessarily be competing with the same regular peer institutions that you, you know, normally think about. So understanding that competitive landscape. Understanding where your brand has the opportunity to stand out and be recognized. Um, if you're not known currently for cybersecurity, it might be hard to launch a program in the online space, even if it's growing. Um, also understanding where you have resources and capabilities within your institution versus those you'll need to part partner for. This is a really important piece um, something we work with institutions with quite a bit, I know Darcy has as well, just to understand what is it that you can actually bring in-house or maybe potentially build in-house um, and what is it that you actually need to partner for. Upfront planning can really help set expectations around investment and required timing. Um, so keeping it, that in mind, uh, that creating a pipeline for enrollment can take sometimes take many months. Um, also thinking about serving your, you know, this adult learner audience, determining where there might be gaps in your student support. Are you able to help students with IT or financial aid questions after hours? Will they be able to get support that they need as they work to fit their education in with their other priorities? So if we go to the next slide. So as Darcy mentioned, and I'll just kind of, you know, reemphasize here, understanding the market landscape is really crucial to getting um, you know, successful online programs off the ground and also in sustained enrollment. So uh, at Blackboard slash Anthology, we regularly, it's, it's hard for me still to say Anthology, it's just this week. So we regularly assess these, these programs, these three areas of um, uh, program viability, competitive landscape and audience, um, just not only to initially go to market, but also so that we can regularly understand what's going on within the market. Um, because these evolve, especially in online, the online space, there's, um, you know, new programs coming on pretty regularly, things change as far as demand, keeping tabs on this is really, really important. Um, and identifying which programs have a sustained demand in addition to being aligned with your brand um, and ability to be competitive is really important. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So for example, if you're thinking about offering a bachelor's degree that's intended for um, your target audience of degree completers, you need to be aware of the fact that there's big online competitors in your space, like in Arizona State, Western Governors. Um, you have to look, then look at, can you compete with them? Can you compete on price? Can you compete on flexibility, lead nurture strategies? These are all things to, to take into consideration. And, you know, and think about as you, as you think about your program, how you build that program to be able to compete and, and grow enrollment. Thinking about your target audience is also important to really be able to understand where you'll be able to stand out. Um, you know, identifying gaps in the market that you can differentiate um, when positioning your programs. And then going to the next slide, um, your in-house capabilities may evolve. Um, so thinking about the partner um, that, that can evolve with you as you, as you grow. Um, there are certain areas, are there certain areas that you think, um, you know, you need to scale for a certain period of time or that more of a sustained outsourcing need. Um, this specific breakdown is actually an example of how one institution currently balances their outsource model. They actually started out with an OPM and then over, seven year, over a seven year period, which was the length of their contract with their OPM, actually began to build out all of the services that you see here um, under in-house services. Um, and they're able to offer those for their large portfolio of online programs while still outsourcing with certain areas. Um, so it's really kind of a mix of things that they're doing in-house as well as partnering with certain things. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Another thing to really kind of take into consideration is, is, is planning ahead. Because going to market effectively with any new programs uh, really requires a pretty lengthy runway. So not only being able to plan and build a program itself, um, but you know, creating a pipeline for enroll, enrollment. So we know that enrolling new students can take 12 to 18 months from the time that a prospective student actually fills out your program, uh, like submits a, an application and eventually enrolls. Um, so that means you need to be building a pipeline of leads for your marketing months before you expect to have your first, first cohort. Um, so just some, some, something to consider there. Um, if you go to the next slide. Uh, the other thing that you'll need to be thinking about is planning for services um, for an online student or an adult learner. 
Um, so we actually conducted a survey earlier this year just to really better understand the needs of and gaps in student support. Uh, we actually found that you, the, the needs for online students is rather unique. Um, I think not surprisingly, technology assistance is more, uh, more likely to be an area that can impact retention. Uh, but one of the things that we also found was that online students were definitely less likely to know where to get that support. Um, so making sure that that's available and easily accessible for online students. Um, we also found that um, you know, non-traditional uh, populations were more likely to be impacted by financial issues. Um, and you know, these are obviously populations that are typically served with online degrees. So making sure that we've got services available to students and that um, we're aware of students' unique needs within this space, that's definitely important. So if we go to the next slide. So, you know, from an institutional perspective, we really look at the online portfolio and the development of online degrees as a life cycle. Um, so like offering online programs can, can really take on this life cycle um, from the beginning of planning development all the way to more sustained and strategic growth. And there's evolution within that, that time period. Some of that is market driven. Some of that is within your own institution. Um, so the stage that you're in really requires a unique focus given your goals, um, but each stage can, stage can provide lots of opportunity for your institution um, and the brand of your institution um, to not only increase revenue, but also serve new students um, in different populations and really provide innovative opportunities that meet market need and demand um, as the face of higher education continues to change. And obviously we've seen a lot of that within the last couple of years with this more and more demand for online. So I'll so, pause there. Go ahead. Yeah, and I, I want to add a couple of things to what Jess was saying um, because we'd like to have some discussion about you know your thoughts. So if you if you think about um, moving your programs forward and thinking about like an OPX where you're picking the things that you need um, and you either do it internally or in, in house or with a partner to do the program viability of which programs are out there, which ones would be good for your school, you have to also kind of combine that with your institutional readiness. And, you know, Jess and I talk about this quite often that, you know, just because um, you find out that an MBA might be popular, if your school of business faculty do not want to go online with that program, you've got a problem. Um, so it's not, you know, it's very comprehensive when you're thinking about which programs I want to take forward. And um, Jess can attest to this, too, that just because you have X number of students enrolling in your programs face to face does not mean that that program will necessarily translate to a competitive program online. Would you agree to that, Jess? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll add to that. I, I think that the thing that we, we see over and over, and I think, I think we're kind of past this now, that idea that an online program is going to cannibalize your face-to-face -face program, because I think it's pretty recognized now that these are very different populations of the types of students that need online versus face-to-face. -face. So I think you're absolutely right. When you think about which program is going to be successful in the online space, you have to be thinking about those things first you know, as you mentioned, just can you as an institution successfully offer that? Do you have the faculty buy-in? Do you have um, the capabilities to run the number of cohorts you might need or, you know, whatever else to, to be able to really offer it? Um, and then do, is there the demand for it? Is it the right type of prospective student audience that would be interested in doing a program like this online? And sometimes, yeah, you may be able to offer it face to face and do really be really successful at it, but in online, you may not necessarily have the right match. Um, I will say that that some of the things that we're seeing is that there is demand in many, many different program areas for online programs. So I think you know we have moved beyond the it's just business and nursing. There's you know there's lots of different um, um, program spaces that we're seeing a, a big uptick in demand for online programs, both from a student perspective and from a workforce perspective. So I think that's the other thing that's really interesting is we also have a lot of um, you know, companies and, and workforce demand for this type of, some of, some of these degrees coming from the online space and that professional upscaling. Exactly, and I know there's a question, but I, I wanna add one more thing. Um, you know, going back to that 
quality learning matrix, and, and I know Jessica's heard me talk about this ad nauseum, um, that, that you have got to start with a vision for your institution for online. You have to start there. And if you don't know what your vision is, that is the first thing that needs to be tackled. And I don't mean the vision of the institution. I mean the vision for online learning um, because so many decisions that you'll be making, like just talked about of what you'll do in-house, what you'll outsource or partner with someone about, it has to go back to realizing who you are, where you want to be so that you can start thinking about how to get from point A to point B. Um, and I will say one thing about the student supports I've had plenty of conversations both before I came to Blackboard and, and since I've been at Blackboard where schools will say, well, we did a study and um, we didn't get enough activity uh, on weekends to our help desk. So we don't think we need 24-7, 365. The, bo you know, the, the bottom line, the, the main thing is that from a competitive point of view, students are looking for that. That's a marketing, it's a, it's a support service that's incredibly important, but it's also part of who you are that makes students want to take your programs. So it, it can't be, well, we don't think we need it. If you're going to be competitive, yes, you do. You've got to have supports available 365, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, um, either combination of doing it in-house and outsource or outsource or completely in-house, but it's just not something that you can skip over. So um, I see we have a question. Yeah, uh, from, uh, first, first question came in from Russ Bullen. Uh, are there playbooks, rubrics, and or consultants that can assist an institution in either making that initial plan and choice of OPM, OPX, and evaluate an institution's OPM, OPX agreement and plan for the future? Do you want to answer that? <laughs> Um, I'll let Jess answer if there are like playbooks and rubrics that can be available. Um, I can tell you that we do, we provide consulting around this area that works with an institution from their vision, establishing the vision, thinking about their strategy, moving into uh, program development that, you know, runs the gamut of all of this to help a school make a better idea, uh, a better plan and you know, evaluate where they are. I mean, Jess, I know we have plenty of tools and the right people to do this kind of work um, that, are, that are there. We do, yeah. I mean, it's sort of, sort of a shameless plug to be like, we, yes, we do this. But um, <laughs> um, there are also, we've also developed some, some content um, that I think can be really helpful in thinking about um, a couple different things. Uh, the the uh, difference between an OPM and an OPX and what you need to be thinking about as you think about getting into that space and potentially partnering uh, with another vendor in that space. And so uh, still on blackboard.com. Um, so those, those items are there as well as um, some information on, um, you know, uh, what we call breaking up with your OPM. So there is, uh, you know, lots of institutions that have gone down the path of a revenue share um, OPM and have now decided that they're in a space where they want to take it on themselves, um, which is, I think we've seen a lot of institutions in this place now. They have sort of matured and grown with an OPM, and now they're in a place where they think that they can um, they can bring some things in house, um, like uh, the institution that I mentioned earlier that we work with. Um, and and then we've worked with institutions to sort of de determine how to do that. There's things to take into consideration, um, you know, as you're making that switch because um, an OPM as Darcy mentioned and I mentioned, uh, does a lot to just get everything set up and going. And there is, there's some work that needs to be done when you have to sort of extract yourself from that, but it absolutely can be done. And the uh, benefit from it, once you come out the other side, if you're able to um, you know, maintain 100% revenue from all your tuition can be really, really fruitful. So we've got some content pieces um, around that uh, and blackboard.com slash OPX actually. Very good, we have another question, but I'd just like to comment on your answer and the question that was posed. Uh, this strikes me as an extraordinarily uh, flexible uh, op option for institutions that are looking for the right mix to dial in between what they have and uh, what they need. Uh, so nice job. Here's another one that came in, I think, uh, through, through uh, Payloop. 
you talked about determining the right balance of service of in-house and partner services. What sort of considerations would you recommend that an institution make when it comes to determining, whoops, there we went, getting questions in now. I'll start uh, there. What, uh, what sort of considerations would you recommend that an institution make when it comes to determining this balance? Would your advice differ if it's an institution new to online versus an institution that already has some online experience and operations? Darcy, do you want to go first or you want me to go? <laughs> go ahead. You go first. I'll follow. Yeah. So I, so I think it, it probably would differ a little bit um, new to, um, to those who have already been in the online space. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of different things. So a lot of it really has to do with in-house capabilities. Um, so one of the things that we see quite a bit um, with institutions is that the area that is um, the areas that they would like to sort of keep in-house really are around um, those that they find that they feel are, um, let's say, foundational to their brand or the way that they develop curriculum and then share that curriculum, right? So things like instructional design, um, content creation, all of that typically will work with institutions that they'll want to, um, you know, have that have that created in house. A lot of times, you know, you can utilize a partner to help supplement to scale. So if you're bringing multiple uh, programs online and maybe you just need um, additional help with instructional design to sort of build those out across multiple courses, um, that can be really helpful, but you really have the um, institution is the one that's driving the content development um, and sort of leading the instructional design. And then you have a vendor that's, that's helping to supplement there. Uh, we do typically see that areas like marketing and um, sometimes enrollment management, especially when it's dealing with very, very high volume of enrollment or lead generation that we're trying to sort of qualify and sift through uh, can, you know, tends to be outsourced. Um, but sometimes that's, you know, a temporary thing. So that's the other thing to think about with, with outsourcing is it doesn't necessarily mean that this is what we're doing and this is what we're doing forever. It may be that you need a partner to help you get to the next phase and then you start to bring enrollment in-house. And then maybe you start to bring portions of marketing in-house, things like that. And one thing that, uh, that I'll mention is when we have conversations with institutions about their visioning and building out a strategy on how they're going to get from point A to point B, I tell people all the time, strategic planning isn't something you have to outsource. You can sit down with people and build a plan that will identify which pieces of the OPX you're going to need and select those and move forward. The difference is if you do outsource the strategic planning, you will get it done a lot faster. Strategic planning at an institution, you've all been in those meetings for your institution, I'm sure at one point or another, they go on forever. Um, if you outsource strategic planning to help you figure all these pieces out, um, it's going to happen in like four to six months, as opposed to maybe a year. And, and, you know, it's really important when you're doing this work um, with OPX, that you try hard not to avoid the people who are barriers on your campus. Um, we all tend to, we know who those people are, um, that can present issues. If you're doing it in house, your natural instinct is to avoid them as you're doing the planning. And when you bring in, um, if you outsource consulting to help you with that planning, you don't have to worry about that because those consultants are going to bring those people in regardless. Um, and it makes for a more, um, over time, usually you can get some of those people to be more champions as opposed to barriers. Because they're hearing from someone else besides you, even if, they're saying the same thing. That's a great point, Darcy. I, and I think one way I think, and I know we've been used this way before, is just to be the third party that says the same thing that, you know, those who have brought us in have already been saying. Um, but sometimes it can be helpful to have that third party, you know, and, and so that's another way to potentially bring in a partner is maybe they're not necessarily, you're not necessarily outsourcing that much to them other than having another voice to come in and say, this is how it should be done to create buy-in across multiple stakeholders. Another question from someone who joined us late, uh, and I, obviously you've addressed this, but could you very quickly 
uh, distinguish between OPM and OPX or define each of them very quickly. Thank you. Yeah, I can really quickly. So OPM, as, as we speak about is um, online program management. Um, OPMs traditionally have been more of a revenue share model where um, the vendor that is working with an institution typically will take a portion of uh, the tuition as their payment. So that's the business model uh, for a revenue share OPM. Um, so OPM, I think, has gotten a little bit more general to be more online program management that does may not necessarily be um, uh, revenue share, but that's sort of the traditional understanding of it. OPX um, is a term that is relatively new. I know Hall and IQ um, typically refers to it as OPX, um, but it's really uh, the way we refer to it is online program experience. And so whatever that experience might be for your institution, for your students that you're really trying to build for them. I think okay. this slide actually does a great job of talking about the differences might be helpful for the person who asked. Yeah. And this will be recorded too. Um, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions while we wait for someone else to jump in. Um, could you give us a better sense of how or what fee for service really means? I guess I'm looking at this, if I have an interest in using your services. Let's, let's back up from your business model and then say, what would be my next step if I'd like to explore a potential partnership with you? Yeah, so, so a fee-for-service model is really around, I'll start, I'll start with that. So a fee-for-service model is really um, uh, paying for those services that you need. And so there's a, there's a couple different ways. So it, it's, um, you know, the model would be maybe if it's, it's dependent on the services, right? Um, so you're paying for hours uh, for a particular consulting engagement. Uh, you may be paying, um, you know, typically for marketing, there is a um, marketing management fee plus the um, media dollars that you need to pay for, right? Um, so you, you are putting that, the, that investment out there um, and then the difference is that, um, you know, obviously with an, with an OPM, they're sort of paying the upfront costs of that. You're not, as an institution, not necessarily paying that. And then the way that they are um, receiving their revenue is through tuition dollars, where they're getting a split of the tuition dollars. In a fee-for-service model, tuition dollars, any enrollments that come through, um, go straight to the, the institution. So 100% of tuition goes back to the institution. And I would think of it as sort of an a la carte menu. Um, if you think of the different elements that that Jess identified that can be from, you know, starts with strategy all the way through student support, um, you know, sitting down and and looking at those elements and thinking, oh, we could do this in house. But no, we can't do that. And so you start picking what makes the most sense, which gives you that freedom to contract for just the services that you need um, and want. And when the contract is done, you know, you're, you're out of the contract. And as Jess mentioned, all the uh, enrollments come to you directly, tuition and fees. Uh, so, I, so I presume that there's some sort of initial step that would involve a needs assessment uh, before any contracts are developed and so forth between a prospective client and, uh, and OPX. Yep. Yeah. I and mean, that's one of the things that I think we recognize and understand is that Institutions are all different. Uh, buying centers are all different, whether it's the business school or the engineering school. There are different objectives and needs within uh, each of the partners that we work with. And so typically what works, what happens on our side is we will typically work with those um, prospective partners to understand what the needs are, to really develop out what that plan would be and what types of services would be needed to kind of meet the objectives that they have. And I think, you know, one of the things that that people should think about when they start working with someone that's going to do OPX, you know, the overall goal should be by the partner to help the institution get to a point where they are self-sustaining on the things that make the most sense for them to be doing in-house and be able to make um, appropriate decisions on outsourcing the things that they don't want to do themselves or can't do themselves. Sometimes it's capabilities. 
Tom, sometimes it's, you know, FTEs, not wanting to add more FTEs and instead outsourcing. So it's not a long-term spend um, by bringing in the right people. But uh, if any, any partner should always have that sort of at the top of mind that the goal is to help the institution not tether themselves to the institution. You know, we, you want to do it it's a business, but you want to do it for the good of education and for the institution and for the client. That should be something that's on your radar when you're talking to people um, about OPX. And I've got another one. <laughs> uh, are you are you LMS agnostic? Yes, or do absolutely. I, do I have to have a Blackboard license to cast extra services? No, now, our, our services, none of these services have anything tied to the LMS at all. They are okay. all agnostic. Does anyone else have anything they'd yeah. like to put out there today? I have thoroughly enjoyed this and it's been so informative. Uh, and I've been around the block a few, a few times. So uh, kudos uh, uh, Darcy and Je Jessica for, for putting this, this new, very flexible approach out there uh, for the online learning digital education marketplace. Great, thank you all. Yep, thanks for having us. All right, thank you everyone. Um, if there's no further questions, I just wanna thank everyone for attending this session. A huge thank you to our moderator and our presenters. Um, there should be a session feedback survey popping up soon. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to fill that in. Speakers enjoy receiving your feedback. We recorded the session and it will be available soon for asynchronous viewing. Please join us for one of the five sessions coming up next. Um, and I think um, if our speakers want to stick around, there's still a little bit more time left. If you have any questions that come up, um, I do see a couple of things in the chat. Um, okay, no further questions, but I think we can stick around a little bit longer if there's any questions, but otherwise, thank you. And please join us for one of the next sessions. Thank you. Hey, Darcy. Yes, sir. Do you remember EduPrize? Oh. This was uh, Bill Graves' company. God, you're going back. I know. That's where we started with, an, with a so-called OPM. I'd have really? to say that Enterprise was an OPX. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, I'm I, impressed. And I'm glad to know about this for the people that I work with. Uh, I think you've got a really good thing going here. Congratulations. Well, thank you. And, and you know, we wanted this to be informative people to people uh, so that they, they have options, you know, they have options, whether it's us or someone else, they can, they, they don't need to get wrapped up with a bunch of services that they don't really need that they could do in house. And they need to be able to be selective on which services they do need and have yeah. that, um, have that <clears throat> flexibility. Yeah. And not locked into a multi-year fit uh, revenue sharing deal. Uh, this is, Anyway, this is uh, this is great. So nice to see you again, Darcy and Jess. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. It's my, been my pleasure to be part of this today. I'm very proud to have this opportunity to be part of your presentation in a in a distant sort of way. Thank you so much, Russ. Yeah, it was you. great to see you too. Bye. So I guess we'll go ahead and go ahead. Hang out. Here's our our email addresses are here if people want to uh, get in touch with us separately. Thank you, Catherine. You're welcome. Thank you both. Yep. Thanks, Thanks Catherine. Jess. All right. Bye. Bye, guys.